I'm Anthony Sembatia, and I'm a Ugandan national. I have a background in social and philosophical studies. I have a master in liberation theology and a master in conflict management, and now I'll follow a PhD program in um, cultural diplomacy. Uh, on the 20th of December 2010, at 7 p.m. in Nairobi, I was on a bus, and this bus was uh, leaving Nairobi, Kenya for Kampala, Uganda. And this bus was hit down by terrorists two minutes before we set off. And on this bus, I think 28 out of the 32 people on the bus died. So I was lucky to be one of the survivors on this bus. Yes. So this gives me an interest in conflict studies and uh, in post-conflict reconstruction. I have previously worked in Uganda with the Caritas, Caritas International, and through that I was able to come with Ka'adi scholarship to Germany. I'm going to talk about very briefly about the future for sustainable development. And um, I would define sustainable development as a development process which enhances people's capacity to create and consume wealth on a lasting basis. But this is influenced by so many factors, socioeconomic, political, and cultural environment. And of course, in many African states, the socioeconomic and the political environment is not very good. Everyone is sure of that. And you know, sustainable development has been very elusive for African nations. It, it remains a myth. And uh, as you know, 41% of the African population, which is roughly 300 million people, by 2008, we are still living on less than $1 a day. On top of that, you know, we have multiple armed conflicts. I am also a, grand, I'm a grandson of Rwandese refugees who immigrated to Uganda. So we are fighting with a crisis, and we are fighting with a tribal tensions and, a, and institutionalism. Uh, we are also having insufficient access to education. That's another threat. Widespread pandemics. Somebody talked about HIV AIDS, and everyone from Africa knows that problem. But more importantly, at, the, at this point in time, we are faced by environmental threats, desertification, deforestation, and climate change. So I'm just going to speak about three major things. What's the relevance of sustainable development? What are the challenges we are facing to have sustainable development? And what are the future recommendations? And that will be it. Uh, Africa is relying basically on agriculture. That's also clear. And that, that would also define what development is for Africa. You cannot talk of development in Africa minus agriculture. You can have so many educated people. You can have a lot of technology and so on and so forth. But uh, without agriculture, uh, sustainable development remains a big joke. So uh, 200 min million people at this point in time in Africa are chronically hungry, maybe myself inclusive, since I feel hungry at this point in time. <laughs> and uh, nearly 30 million require emergency food, and they require ag ag agricultural assistance every year. You cannot believe that. Uh, food is imported from Europe and from the United States and sent to Africa to give people food aid. That is unacceptable. It is, it is unbelievable. It is a big shame for us as black Africans because the land we have is very, very fertile. So we have to reflect at that very deeply. And also, many kids are suffering from malnutrition. And today we have a disease called protein energy malnutrition. Uh, many people are not able to function normally. You know, they are not fit. They are... Yes, they have big stomachs, you know. <laughs> when I was a kid, maybe my, yeah. When I was a kid, I used to ask my mother, are we pregnant? And she said, no. <laughs> she said, you're very fine. But really, seriously, this is protein energy malnutrition. And you cannot talk of development. You cannot tell people to, to develop when they're on hungry stomachs. I mean, they are not physically fit, you know. They are not stable enough. It leads to stunting, and it leads to poor cognitive development. The education specialists know this. Uh, so, also we have a myriad of health-related problems. That one you're sure about that. You know, we have a lot of health issues. And um, many of the key determinants and solutions to the health disease outside the direct realm of health are outside the direct realm of the health sector. That is to say... We have issues to do with environment. We have issues to do with water and sanitation. We have problems with agriculture. We have issues to do with education, employment, urban and rural livelihoods. So what do we do? How do we go on from that 
point. Uh, I think there is an importance for intergovernmental relations, intergovernmental engagements. And um, what challenges do we face at this point in time? And this goes to my research paper. My research paper will be on terrorism as a threat to regional integration. Uh, one of the greatest challenges of the world today, I think number one challenge for me and you is terrorism. But the question is, what is terrorism? That's, what, that's, where, that's basically my research. What is terrorism and who has the capacity to define what terrorism is? And um, who are terrorists? So that is the big question. That's where my research was sent around. And I'll address how terrorism is uh, hindering or is uh, blocking the integration of the East African community, Uganda, Kenya, Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania. Uh, some other challenges towards sustainable development are mass poverty and underdevelopment. Of course, everyone knows that. Restrictive political regimes, everyone knows that. Uh, corruption, of course. And of course, uh, conflict, uh, you know, uh, regional conflicts. East Africa has, Africa has been hit by regional conflicts, and that's also very clear in uh, the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, in the South Sudan, in Libya, in Egypt, among other countries. So uh, my thought would be that without peace, development is not possible. But also without development, peace is not durable. You know, one time, I, uh, because when you, when you are not developed, when you are not financially stable, or when you have wealth but it is not sustainable, then you are at risk. One time I was on a train, and because I, I did not have money, I, I was, ended up buying a, a train ticket for children. So I was, I was, I was a caught because I bought a train ticket for children, and uh, I had to pay a fine of almost 40 euros. <laughs> In this way, really, in this way, I was blocking my peace. It was not sustainable in any way. So without peace, without peace, development is not possible. And without development, peace is not sustainable. <laughs> uh, what, what is the future for sustainable development in Africa? And that will be my end towards. I think um, African countries need to build a, a diverse range of human and institutional capacities. We need to look at aspects like genetic engineering, uh, molecular biology, biochemical engineering, plant breeding, and we, we need to look at bioinformatics. There is also need to create national agencies and international agencies uh, to help projects, to help coordinate projects in the issue of uh, institutional development. But more importantly, there is need to, uh, to strengthen security partnerships on local, national, regional, and international level. In this way, we don't need, uh, we would do this, for example, by uh, setting up terrorist interdiction programs. We would set up hardware and software. And with this, terrorist hardware and software would uh, block terrorists, who, who I don't know, but it would block them from freedom of movement and freedom of access to other nation states. Uh, states cannot integrate if they have a security threat, they cannot peacefully integrate. Uh, they cannot peacefully develop. You cannot peacefully talk of education. You cannot talk of cultural engagement if you don't understand the culture of the other. Or you cannot talk of religious freedoms if you don't understand the religion of the other. So I, I would conclude by saying security partnerships are very important. Regional integration is also very important. Uh, we need to look at very, very importantly food security and a, an increased reduction on dependence on food aid. Thank you very much. I would like I'm to answer your question about terrorism. Yeah. Uh, a very small insect uh, was once asked, who is the brutal and the most dangerous animal? Yeah. And she said, the bird. To me, the bird is a very peaceful animal, but yeah. to the insect, it's a brutal animal. So the definition of terrorism depends on whether you are an insect or a bird. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for your very short presentation. Um, that was good. But I actually would like for you to talk a little bit more about how you see African governments working together um, to combat terrorism. Because you're saying it's a way for them, um, because of terrorism, they cannot um, work together, no re regional integration. But there's also a way, if they work together, <laughs> that can build regional integration. So I'm curious about how you see them working together and how that can be used as an example for West Africa, because we're 
going through some of the similar things that's happening in East Africa. So I'm wondering if there's been any uh, I would quickly answer that by saying uh, setting up of uh, uh, regional security initiatives or regional security spy networks, intelligence networks. We have what we call the Interpol, for example, the International Police. The Interpol is more a Eurocentric kind of security system and it is not serving to the interests of the African people. Uh, so African nations need to set up um, security partnerships that share, uh, that share high-level risky security information, you know? <laughs> and um, to be able to coordinate this information, I cannot pass on information from Uganda to Rwanda if I have a cold feet for Rwanda, <laughs> if I'm a security boss. But uh, if the terrorists will hit at the Uganda-Rwanda border, both Ugandans and Rwandans will die, and uh, it will hinder travel of individuals, it will, hinder tra it will hinder movement of goods and trade. So there is need to create regional security partnerships. Uh, you can talk of Afropol, maybe African police, the East African regional police, the West African regional police, the Central African regional police, and this you can have a, a strong African international police or something like that. In the, in the aspect of, for example, in the aspect of the African Union. Yeah, but the, the security aspect of the African Union. Yeah, but you see the African Union is also not very functional. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, Professor. Thank you, I wanted to answer her question, or her comment, and married to this. That first to us, a terrorist is somebody who makes peaceful living impossible. So it doesn't matter whether it's a bird or an insect or an elephant. <laughs> once you make, once you threaten peaceful living, you are a terrorist. Therefore, even governments can become terrorists. In fact, governments are the real terrorists in Africa because they trample on our rights and they make it impossible for us to live peacefully and go about our rightful engagement to any living. Having said that, therefore, I think that the way to eliminate terrorism or minimize it is through commitment to equity and justice. So no matter how much of regional security we have, international security we have, once you indulge in injustice, in non-recognition of other people's culture, you are likely to breed terrorists even in your family. Children that disobey their parents, children that ignore the role that their fathers played in their upbringing, or they will not appreciate that we are all product of a labor in the world that threatened the life of our mothers, and so should be grateful to them, whatever they become after that. That's what I'm saying. So we should recognize that we are human beings created equally. That's why whether you are white or black or green and so on, you have two eyes, two hands, two legs, and so on. We have equal potentials, but we would not exhibit or exploit these potentials equally. That would create the inequalities in the world. And so societies must make laws, and that's where I come to you, madam, the lawyer, that protect the weak, but assures them a living, and allows the strong to benefit from the exercise of their strength, all living in a peaceful environment. And that's why I'm saying that culture becomes the cent central to peaceful living and minimizing terrorism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. But I also think every people get the government they deserve because we choose our own leaders. So from this high-level conversation, we should then change all our governments. Eh? <laughs> we, should, we should go back and overthrow them. <laughs> No, I'm saying, sir, that the world must be reconstructed to diminish the role of governments and nations. Because the nation state came up from the Treaty of Westphalia in the 15th century, isn't it? So the world was not organized along national lines before. And governments didn't have the strength that they have now. We were schooled, oriented into thinking that this is the best way of living together. And now I'm saying that since our culture shows that we are basically the same, with cultures having a good part and some bad part, we should begin to say that governments are not the way to live into the future. And that's why globalization came in, that's why transnational government came in, that's why the sovereignty 
is no longer residing in the nation, so that if a leader maltreats his people, another bigger power has the right to step in and remove that government. Because we are a collective of people with human rights that are universal and must be enforced universally. Thank you very much.